Hey class, Mushroom Top Walter here. That's right, the Shroom Fro is real and the Shroom Fro is permanent. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started on week eight dissociative disorders. Um, go ahead and get ready to take some notes, download the slides from Compass. Remember, we have a quiz this week, goes live on Wednesday. So hopefully you're not watching this on Wednesday. Hopefully you're watching this on Monday or Tuesday. But uh, if it's Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, uh, good luck cramming. All right, everybody, let's get moving. All right, let's start with some quick questions here. Have you ever felt like you were in a dream rather than reality? Yes or no? Think about it. Okay, a little bit of inception action there, right? I have a video with Neil deGrasse Tyson. It's going to tell us a little bit about simulation theory or the theory that we're in a simulation, a little bit different from simulation theory. So don't quote me on that. Watch this video and enjoy the fact that my YouTube channel is now demonetized. Elon Musk says that we're living in a simulation. Uh, it's, He's not the only person that theorizes this. Basically, we're in a video game being controlled by higher beings and we're right. all just like in Super Mario Brothers. Yes. Uh, I wish I had a good argument against that hypothesis and I do not. So you think it's very, really? you think it's probable? If, you, if you're playing Mario, yeah. Super Mario, and there he is jumping. Well, right now it's Fortnite, honey. But Fortnite, okay. <laughs> if whatever is your game, if whatever is your game, if you were in there and you were a scientist, you would be exploring the rules that apply to that game, right? right. How high can you jump? Right. How fast do bullets fly? And you make a canon of laws of physics. That would be your world. And then you, you'd wonder, am I real or am I not? If, and, and now watch, someone programs a universe, and in there they gain maturity and technology, and then they program a universe, and then they program a universe. Mm -hmm. So you can have nested, simulated universes all the way down, but there's only one real universe. Now throw a dart at all those universes, which one are you most likely to hit? A simulated universe. So are we, can we simulate? I wish I had a good argument against that. And I do not. It's a wild, wild theory. Well, how do you explain like women and men getting together and nine months later a baby and being born and like? It's just a video game. It's just a video game. No, yeah. no that's what, way. That's a theory that has been out that's there. That's exactly while. what the programmer programmed you to. You think. need to go to bed at night. <laughs> <laughs> you need to take your tail to bed. No, I can tell you coming up with this. Stuff. I didn't had enough. Yeah. <laughs> so, enough of him today. So, and what, what about the universe aliens? is under no obligation to make sense to you. Mm. Right. Okay. <laughs> no, you didn't. Oh, yes, I did. Oh, no, you didn't. Mm, uh, yes, I did. We, I wanted to get to those, but we you all are also... showing out today. <laughs> we all are. We're all in trouble. Well, we I know, know you what is this gang up on Val? I, I know you've I been called doing 911. Yeah. He got yeah. on me. I know. You say the universe is mad at me? Yeah. <laughs> well, we gotta get to this. Go, 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 go. We hit the streets of Chicago to see what questions uh, people have oh, for beautiful. you. A person on the street question. Here we yeah, go. Yeah, let the people talk, Ryan. All right, so now that you're uh, filled with existential dread, shout out to Mario Brothers. What's up? So now you're sitting here wondering if you actually exist, that this is all real. This is just a video game where somebody's playing us trying to get that high score, GGGL. So what do you think about this right here, right? What do you think? Are we living in a simulation? Yes? No? The devs are listening. What do you think? All right. Let's take a look right there. This is all for jokes, too. Some of you, I'm going to put this in the participation points, and some of you are going to get mad at me and be like, oh, Walter, you should talk cover course content and the uh, participation points. Yeah, it's called the reading questions and it's called the quizzes. Chill out, these are free points. Seriously, I give you 75 of them, calm down. Dissociation, simply put, is a removal from reality or the experience of feeling like you are removed from reality. So dissociation is going to be like a disconnect between like a person's um, thoughts, memories, feelings, actions, or sense of who they are. So this is going to be a normal process of life ex of lived experiences because a lot of us have had a sensation of feeling disconnected from reality as if we're viewing ourselves from the outside or this is just this is this reality doesn't seem right. Well, let me give you some examples of some like some mild dissociative experiences. Common mild dissociative experiences the experiences are going to be things like daydreaming Highway hypnosis, uh, getting lost in a book or a movie. Shout out to Haunting a Bly Manor on Netflix. Go ahead and watch it. Of these kind of sensations, this is the experience of you losing touch with awareness, with your immediate surroundings. Just like 
drink a pot of coffee and study for an exam, that feeling where like everything else kind of like blacks out and you're like focused in on what you're looking on the screen and everything else kind of drifts away. That's the experience of dissociation. So dissociative disorders include problems with memory, identity, emotion, perception, behavior, and sense of self. So these dissociative symptoms can actually disrupt every area of your mental functioning. So right over here is a spectrum of dissociative symptoms. So we were just talking about like things that are normal, normal, normal dissociative experiences, binging on Netflix. So right over here, we're like meditation, hypnosis, being super concentrated, focus on your work. We're talking about getting absorbed into a te television series. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we have some of the disorders. Dissociative disorders involve problems with memory, identity, emotion, perception, behavior, and sense of self. Dissociative symptoms, these can potentially disrupt every area of mental functioning that you have. All right, so examples of dissociative symptoms are going to include the experience, experiences of detachment or feelings as if you are outside of your body and you have this loss of memory or this, uh, this amnesia. And so dissociative disorders are frequently associated with, you know, previous experiences of trauma. So during a traumatic experience, like such as like an accident or a disaster, being a victim of a crime, dissociation can actually help a person tolerate, or it's theorized that a dissociation helps a person uh, tolerate what might otherwise be difficult to bear in a, in a way of like protecting oneself. In situations like these, a person may dissociate the memory of the place, circumstances, or feelings about the overwhelming event, um, mentally escaping from fear, pain, and horror associated with the traumatic event. And this might make it difficult to uh, later remember the details of the experience as reported by many disaster or accident survivors where they're like, well, I don't know what happened. All of a sudden I was upside down in a ditch or all of a sudden the, the roof had collapsed on me and I was trapped or something like that. So let's think about it. So think about your lived experience. Have you ever had an out of body experience? Think about it. Have you ever felt like you were removed from reality? Have you ever felt like you were in somebody else's body looking at yourself do something? All right. It's actually very common, you know? Don't you but doing the drug. So let's talk about some dissociative disorders. So right over here, these are going to be some pathological forms of dissociative disorders. So we're going to go through dissociative amnesia, depersonalization, derealization disorder, and dissociative identity disorder. So the first things first, we're gonna start with dissociative amnesia. And there's gonna be four criteria on here that we wanna go over. Criterion A is going to be an inability to recall important autobiographical information, usually of a traumatic or stressful nature, that is inconsistent with ordinary forgetting. So dissociative amnesia most, most often consists of localized or selective amnesia for a specific event or group of events. Generalized amnesia is different from dissociative amnesia. So dissociative amnesia most often consists of localized or selective amnesia for a specific event or events. And But this could also present itself as like general amnesia for like life, like for your identity and your life history. So criterion B is gonna be the symptoms cause clinically significant distress or impairment in social, occupational, or other important areas of functioning. The disturbance is not attributable to the psych, the physiological effects of a substance. So that'd be alcohol or other drugs of abuse or medication or a neurological or other medical condition. This includes complex seizures, transient global amnesia, or any kind of sequelae of a closed head injury or traumatic brain injury, or other neurological conditions. And criterion D, the disturbance is not better explained by dissociative identity disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, acute stress disorder, somatic symptom disorder, or major or mild neurocognitive disorder. When we're gonna diagnosis, we wanna make sure that we are trying to rule out things at the same time. So we're trying to diagnose somebody with something, but we're also trying to see, make sure that they don't make criteria for something else. So if you have somebody who expresses some of these symptoms, what you might wanna start doing is assessing for some of these uh, like similar disorders, PTSD, DID, also like traumatic brain injuries. And we're asking them about, you know, recreational drug uses, you know, 
Oh, you know what I'm talking about? Yo, you want to just check on it, make sure that nothing else is going on. So let's talk about a dissociative fugue state. One of my favorite episodes of Breaking Bad. I might as well, no, I'm not going to put it in the video. I don't need to get a copy strike. There was an episode where Walter White, um, oh, I just realized that his name was Walter. Damn. Where Walter White went missing and he didn't know how to come back and explain everything to his wife. So he decided to act like he was having a dissociative fugue state. Dissociative fugue state is, it's going to be a period of time where there's like a temporary, uh, a temporary loss of a sense of identity where an individual might impulsively wander or travel away from their homes or places of work. So the individual often becomes confused about who they are and creates additional identities. And then outwardly, people with the this, this uh, dissociative fugue state show no signs of illness. Like there's no strange appearance or odd behavior. If you're in a dissociative fugue state, you're walking around, you're living life, you're doing what you're doing. And then people might be talking to you. You might say like, hey, what's your name? Oh, my name is James and here's my ID and let me get on this plane. Let me get on this train, whatever I'm doing. Like from the outside, the person looks completely normal. From the inside, they have no idea what's going on. Comes to dissociative amnesia, there is a dissociative fugue specifier. So once again, this dissociative fugue is going to be purposeful travel or bewildered wandering that is associated with amnesia or for identity or other important autobiographical information. Now, it's an important distinction is that you can have dissociative amnesia with or without a fugue state. Okay. So once again, let's just recap that that's associated with amnesia real quick. The main symptom is memory loss that's more severe than normal forgetfulness and can't be explained by a medical condition. So you're not gonna be able to recall information about yourself, about events or people in your life, especially surrounding a traumatic time. Uh, dissociative amnesia can be specific to um, events in a certain time frame. This could be like intense combat or more rarely, you can actually have a complete loss of memory about yourself, that general amnesia. So it might sometime involve travel or confused wandering, a away from your life, that is dissociative fugue, and an episode of amnesia occurs suddenly and may last minutes, hours, or rarely months or years. So it's like that whole, you know, daytime television, you're about to get canceled, so you throw the amnesia episode in, you'd extend it for another season. That has nothing to do with anything. All right, so we have a video here about a dissociative fugue state. We're gonna go ahead and watch this, take some notes, think about the symptoms I just talked about, maybe download the DSM-5 chapter and read through that, those little red boxes, that's gold, that's what you need. All righty, go ahead and watch this video. I'll be back in a minute. Hannah Up went missing for 20 days in New York. When she was pulled out of the river, she had no memory of where she had been. This is the story of a rare psychological condition. The last thing Hannah remembered was going for a run along Riverside Drive in Manhattan. The next day, the 23-year-old was set to begin the new school year as a teacher at Thurgood Marshall Harlem in September of 2008. When her friends and family discovered she was missing, and they found her passport, wallet, metro card, and ID in her apartment, they searched all over the city, dividing it into sections, searching in groups, putting up flyers as they went. Though they were optimistic, they feared the worst. It didn't make any sense why she would disappear. Her friends said of her, She lights up the room. Everyone you talk to is going to say she is their closest friend. She was raised to trust and care for everyone. In a Manhattan Apple store, a student of Pace University stopped a woman in running gear. When he asked her if she was the missing teacher, she waved him off and left the store. Police showed the security footage to Hannah's mom, Barbara, who was certain it was her. But they were at a loss as to why she denied her identity and why she hadn't contacted anyone who knew her or where she was going. Twenty days after her disappearance, the captain of the Staten Island Ferry spotted what they assumed was a dead body floating face down in the water. Two crew members boarded a skiff to fish the body out. When they did, she gasped for air and began to cry. She was sunburned on one half of her body, and her skin looked as if she had been in the water for a long time. She had no idea of how she got there, or how much time had passed, but she remembered she was Hannah Up. A short while later, she was on her way to the hospital to be treated for hypothermia, where she would be reunited with her friends and family. Doctors diagnosed Hannah as having dissociative fugue, a rare type of amnesia that involves a loss of identity and the inability to recall the past. For 20 days, she didn't know where she went, where she slept, or what she did and what she ate and drank, and how she managed to survive alone in one of the largest and busiest cities in the world. Dissociative few can last from a few hours to many years. It is often reversible, but not always. 
and if it does end, requires no treatment. It usually involves travel or wandering. People have been known to travel across continents, says Dr. Philip Coons, a professor emeritus at Indiana University. The explanation behind the fugue is that the person is running away from a bad situation. It is often the result of a trauma, and is most commonly associated with childhood victims of sexual abuse who learn over time to dissociate memory from the abuse. Something triggers the memory of the trauma, which results in either erasure of the victim's identity or a completely new identity forms in its place. It is one of the least understood psychological conditions having been largely ignored. Aaron Krasner, a professor of clinical psychiatry, believes this is because the phenomena is so frightening. It's terrifying to think that we are all vulnerable to a lapse in selfhood. The truth is that identity and personality are not as concrete as we think they are. We tend to experience our identity as a thing, as if it's a constant, says Dr. Lowenstein, who's the leading doctor on fugues. But it's a lot less stable and has less unity than we want to believe. Pierre Jeannette was the first to develop formal theory on the condition. In 1889, he wrote, Personal unity, identity, and initiative are not primitive characteristics of psychological life. They are incomplete results, acquired with difficulty after long work, and they remain very fragile. Pierre Jeannette's research fell into obscurity when counter-theories, such as those of Freud, became more prevalent, and has only recently begun to resurface. Throughout history, there have been many strange cases of dissociative fugue, but radical notions of the self have often been viewed with distrust. Judy Roberts, a reporter for the Tacoma News Tribune, disappeared in 1985 and was found 12 years later living in Alaska under the name Jane D. Williams. There were suspicions that she faked amnesia, but experts have come to believe that she genuinely experienced a fugue state. AMN, a 23-year-old insurance worker, had a fear of fire ever since witnessing a car crash at the age of four. One of the cars caught on fire. An AMN saw the driver burn alive and heard their screams as their face was pressed up against the window. Many years later, AMN discovered a small fire in their basement which triggered a fugue state. They had barely any memory of their partner of six years or their friends and co-workers. Ansel Bourne, the namesake of Jason Bourne, was a carpenter in 1857 when he was seized with the idea of becoming a preacher in Rhode Island after he experienced amnesia. Then in 1887, he went to Norristown, Pennsylvania, where he set up shop as a stationer and confectioner using the name A.J. Brown. Two months later, he woke in the morning not knowing where he was and having no memory of the last few months. Two psychologists traveled to study him, William James of Harvard and Richard Hodgson of the Society of Physical Research. Under hypnosis, he was able to access both personalities, but neither had any knowledge of the other. Hannah's mother, Barbara, believes that Hannah didn't adopt a new personality, but instead had a complete absence of identity, a kind of dangerous nothingness. With the help of police and doctors, she managed to piece together some of what she did. She logged into her email at the Apple Store, but nothing was sent or read. Doctors attributed her logging in to muscle memory, doing so out of habit. But once she opened her email, she didn't know who Hannah was and why everyone was looking for her, so she logged out and left. She spent a lot of time on Riverside Drive. Later, she said of Riverside Drive, there's something soothing about the sound of the water and just not feeling trapped in the concrete jungle. She had a large blister on her foot, which was evidence of the amount of time she spent on the move. It might partially explain why she removed her shoes and went in the water. I don't think I had a purpose, she said. Maybe I just didn't want my shoes anymore. She entered the water at Chelsea Pier at night during a full moon, a place she recalls as being where she attended a 9-11 memorial that had lanterns floating in the water. She swam several miles until she reached Robin's Reef, a small island with a lighthouse, which perhaps she was drawn to. She spent the next day on the rocks, where she got sunburned on one side of her body. The following morning, she entered the water again at around 11 a.m. Shortly thereafter, she was rescued by the crew of the Staten Island Ferry. Dr. Lowenstein says of people in fugues that there's a quality of them running away from whatever you are trying to ask them. If you begin to hold on to them and try to get them to stay in one place, they go. They're gone. When people recover from fugues, they typically feel shame, guilt, and embarrassment. 
It's weird, she told the New York Times. How do you feel guilty for something you didn't even know you did? It's not your fault, but it's still somehow you. So it's definitely made me reconsider everything. Who was I before? Who was I then? Is that part of me? Who am I now? She observed how her own struggles with identity are not far removed from what we all experience. When you're just starting out, you have one job to your name. There's your professional identity, and then there's who you are, she said. She may be questioning who she is after experience, but everybody is. This is just extra. It is reminiscent of how experts in the field view identity. Ethel Cardenia, a professor of psychology at Lund University in Sweden, said, In our culture, we have a nice narrative that personality is stable. That is a fiction. When a person enters a fugue and becomes someone else, or isn't there, it's an exaggerated version of the way we all are. Having no idea what the catalyst for a fugue was, Hannah had no way of preventing it in the future. Four years after her first incident, she disappeared again. And once again, at the start of a new school year, this time in Maryland. After disappearing for 48 hours, she awoke to find herself in water, a creek, about a mile and a half from her school. She had been texting, and on looking at the messages, there became a point where she didn't remember writing any of them. Later, Hannah moved to the U.S. Virgin Islands and continued to teach. Then Hurricane Irma hit St. Thomas on September 6, 2017. Hannah had texted friends that she was safe, but the island was devastated. She told them she didn't recognize anything. Shortly after Hannah's roommates said they wanted to leave the island, Hannah decided to stay. School is going to be the first step toward normality for these kids, she said. That next day, a roommate saw her get into her car to go to school, but she never arrived. Her friends and family have been looking for her, but as of today, Hannah Up is still missing. All right, so I hope you liked that video. Um, wasn't disturbing at all. That's a, that's a YouTube channel called Graveyard Shift. That is not a scientifically based YouTube channel with rigorous peer-reviewed research methodologies. So do not take that as an example of how you should be writing your papers or reporting your findings. And none of that information is going to be on the quiz, except for the information that overlaps what we go over in lecture okay okay just want to put that out there and also if you enjoy youtube videos go to your youtube search bar and type in liminal spaces have some fun okay so let's talk about depersonalization and derealization disorder we're going to go over the five criterion for this disorder depersonal derealization disorder requires the presence of persistent or recurrent experiences of depersonalization, derealization, or both. So depersonalization is going to be experiences of unreality, attachment, or being an outside observer with respect to one's thoughts, feelings, sensations, their body, actions, etc. So this could be like perceptual alterations, a distorted sense of time, unreal or absent self, um, emotional and or physical numbing. And there's also derealization. And derealization is going to be experiencing of unreality or detachment with respect to one's surroundings. So this could be feeling that individuals or objects that, the individ that somebody is experiencing are unreal, they're like dreamlike, foggy, lifeless, or visually distorted. There's gonna be some differences here. I want us to think about this for a second. Depersonalization is you feeling like you are detached from your body. So right over here, so this is a screen grab right here from Netflix show Black Mirror and this episode, this lady passes away, but before she dies, she has her consciousness uploaded into a teddy bear and so she can view through the teddy bear's eyes and can respond with like a yes or no, happy or sad. She has no, like she feels detached from what's going on. So she's there, she's seeing what's happening, but she can only observe, she can't interact. And that's the feeling of being depersonalized, right? Now derealization, that's like if you're to like walk into a room and you're like, this room isn't real. Nothing here is real. Like this desk isn't real. This microphone, this keyboard, none of this is real. This bed that keeps hopping up. Cause my, look at this, look at that, look in the background there. What is that? It's not real, it's not there. You see what I'm I'm saying like that's derealization, right? That's a bad explanation, but read the DSM-5 kids. So criterion B states that during the depersonalization or derealization experiences, reality testing remains intact. Reality testing, what is reality testing? That means that the individual is, is aware that what's happening is outside of the normal realm of experiences, right? And so they're, they're trying to make sure things are real, right? They're testing reality. They're like, can you see me? Like you're there, right? Yeah, we, we're okay, cool. Um, this is real. This 
this is real, right? Okay, this thing that keeps popping up in the back. Oh, that's a thing. Uh oh, that's actually there. That's a real thing. You see what I'm saying? So that's so reality testing. They're still testing the reality. Now, if someone just gives in to what's going on, if they're just like, they give in to the depersonalization, they give in to the derealization, and they're just living the dream, right? Well, then that might be indicative of something else. Criterion C, the symptoms cause clinically significant distress or impairment in social, occupational, or other important areas of functioning. So let's say you go out and you get a big extra large pizza, you come home, sit in your bed like I do on a Saturday, you eat the whole pizza and you zone out watching Netflix horror shows and then you take a nap in the middle of the afternoon and then you wake up and you're like, oh boy, what's going on, man? Oh man, you're looking around and you feel discombobulated and you, your belly's full of pizza and you're like, oh, the eye gun, Ugh, what time is it? And you look around and oh, you don't know what's going on, right? That might be like, you know, a disorienting kind of experience, right? And that could come across as like some kind of depersonalized, derealized, whatever, but it's not really calling, we're not really like causing like significant levels of distress or impairment. That's an isolated episode. Don't worry about it. In order for this to be a disorder, once again, you always have to have some kind of clinically significant distress or impairment. For those of you who don't know what clinical significance is, is different from statistical significance. So in statistically significant, I have some numbers, I calculate them together. I see that there's a difference greater than chance. And I say, oh, look, I put a little star on there, a little asterisk, statistically significant. Now here's the thing, an individual might not notice that statistically significant difference, right? So that's why when we talk about clinically significance, this is where others or the individual themselves notice the differences. They notice the stress. They notice the impairment. It's palpable to them. It's real. You know, they can, they can feel it. They can see it. It's not just like some measurement, right? Okay. So let's move on here. D. So criterion D, the disturbance is not attributable to the physiological effects of a substance or like a drug of abuse or a medication or some other kind of medical condition like seizures. Don't do drugs, kids. Stay sober. And then let's go to criterion E. The disturbance is not better explained by another mental disorder, such as schizophrenia, panic disorder, major depressive disorder, acute stress disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, or another dissociative disorder. So let's go ahead and summarize that all up there, right? So depersonalization, derealization disorder is going to involve a ongoing or episodic sense of detachment of or being outside of yourself, observing reactions, feelings, and thoughts and self from a distance as like watching yourself through a movie, depersonalization. And other people and other things around you may feel attached and foggy or dreamlike and time may be slowed down or sped up and the world may seem unreal. Derealization. You may experience derealization, depersonalization, or both. Symptoms which can be profoundly distressing may only last a few moments or may come and go again over many years. Let's move forward. Oh wait, here we go. Actually, I, I realized I never hit the next button on the slide, um, but you should have the slides downloaded anyways. This is college. Don't blame me because I forgot to press the button. Next, let's talk about dissociative identity disorder. So dissociative identity disorder was commonly referred to as multiple personality disorder beforehand. And there's a whole bunch of things we can talk about multiple personality disorder. This is the thing. See, usually when we are doing in-person stuff, everybody want to talk about this. Why? Because like they saw the movie Split and they were convinced it was a thing. When I was younger, it was me, myself, and Irene. Uh, that was a really big one. Another one was, uh, there was one that had uh, Edward Norton in it and Richard Gere and Edward Norton had like multiple personalities. I don't know, man. Can't remember. It was a long time ago. And then before that, there was Sybil. So those are some like um, media examples of dissociative identity disorder. So let's go over the criteria. Criterion here, and then you can find this in the DSM-5 as well. So dissociative identity disorder, criterion A is a disruption of identity characterized by two or more distinct personality states, which may be described in some cultures as an experience of possession. The disruption in identity involves marked discontinuity in the sense of self and sense of agency. This is accompanied by a related alterations in affect, behavior, consciousness, memory, perception, cognition, and or sensory motor functioning. These signs and symptoms may be observed by others or reported by the individual. That's criterion A. So what is affect? Affect's mood. All right, make sure you remember that. Then we're gonna have criterion B. This is gonna be recurrent gaps in the recall of everyday events, important personal information, and or traumatic events that are inconsistent with ordinary forgetting. C, the disturbance causes what level? Clinically significant level of distress or impairment in social, occupational, or other important areas of functioning. The disturbance is not a normal part of a broadly accepted cultural or religious practice. So in children, the symptoms are not better explained by imaginary playmates or other kinds of fantasy play. I want to be an astronaut. I want to be a cowboy. I want to be a space alien. The symptoms are not attributable to the physiological effects of a substance, blackouts, or chaotic behavior during 
alcohol intoxication as a good example or other medical conditions such as like partial complex seizures. Don't do drugs, kids, and don't drink to excess. Drink responsibly, but only if you're over 21. Don't, I don't, don't want to get sued by your parents. The fragmentation of identity may vary with a culture. So for example, you might have, you might show up as like a possession form and then other circumstances can also affect the presentation of these episodes. So thus individuals may experience discontinuities in identity and memory that may not be immediately evident to others or obscured by attempts to hide dysfunction. You're gonna have two or more distinct identities or personality states. These are known as alters. We'll get into that a little bit later. So each of these are gonna have its own relatively enduring pattern of perceiving related to and thinking about the environment and self. Amnesia must occur either in the recall of everyday events or important personal information and or traumatic events. All right, so let's sum that up real quick. And by the way, uh, you really should be downloading those DSM-5 chapters that I give you and reading the red box. Okay, so in individuals with dissociative identity disorders experience recurrent inexplicable intrusions into their conscious functioning and sense of self. Those are going to be like voices, dissociated actions and speech, intrusive thoughts, emotions and impulses. They're going to have alterations in sense of self. This is going to be attitudes, preferences, and feeling like one's body or actions are not their own. Odd changes of perception, like this is going to be like depersonalization, derealization, and feeling like detached from one's body while like cutting. And then it's going to be intermittent functional neurological symptoms. Okay. Now stress often produces transient exacerbation of dissociative symptoms, which make them more evident. So that means stress can make things worse. Stress is very important in a lot of these different disorders. I want you to think about that. Hmm. Think about stress, stress management. Here we go. All right. Oh, hey, what's going on here? All right. So we got a video. We're going to watch it. I'm going to go away. Um, you know, and then when we get done with the video, we're going to go ahead and talk about it. Actually, no, no we're not. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, jump out the way here. Let's go ahead and watch the video. Anytime the personalities come out, I'm afraid that I may never come back again. With help from Kim Noble's therapist, Kim's alternate personalities come out one by one. First dominant personality, Patricia, disappears, and Bonnie takes over. Bonnie used to be the main personality who took care of daughter Amy. Hello. <laughs> nice to see you. It's, it's a long time to see. I know. Give me a kiss. Yeah, it's nice to see him. Amy doesn't get to see Bonnie very much anymore. In the early years, the constant threat of having her daughter taken away by social services sent Bonnie into seclusion. When Bonnie disappeared, I think I was about seven or eight. It got very stressful with uh, social services were um, putting a lot of pressure on us. So I just couldn't take any more. And I just crept up over it all and um, that was it. Just, uh, I just, I want her to just be happy and have a good life. <laughs> so, I just pray that we, we don't affect her. But I don't think we have so far. Knowing it's time for Bonnie to leave, she bursts into tears because she doesn't know when she will see her daughter again. We can wait a minute. A little while later, Ken emerges. He's 21 years old, homosexual, and doesn't acknowledge he is one of many personalities. Hi, Ken, I'm Kirsten. Ken thinks I'm one of his friend's daughters. And why do you see a therapist? People got problems with me being gay, so I see a therapist. Who has a problem with that? The outside world. Do you date? Um, I have, haven't for a long time, but yeah, I, I, I've had some nice boyfriends. When you look in the mirror, who do you see? Me. But are, Who do you you're see? You're a man. <laughs> when I look at you, I, I see a woman. I'm not transvestite. <laughs> this is strange. I, yeah, I'm gay, but I'm not a transvestite. Okay. I don't dress up in girls' clothes. I've got no boobs. 
One of Kim's more tortured personalities is agitated when she comes out. Evil, evil. Her name is Salome. Hi, Salome, I'm Kirsten. She's really evil. Salome is a personality who rants and raves. She doesn't sit down, she's always walking around the room and not settled. Salome is deeply religious and seems quite angry. She was a good Catholic woman, an evil daughter. What happened, Salome, to the she good Catholic was, woman? She died. She got killed. She died. That's it. And, I've and got to go now. Bye. After Salome leaves, things get much calmer when the personality Dawn arrives. She's literally frozen in time and believes it's 1997, the year Amy was born. Hi, Dawn. Mm -hmm. Nice to meet you. Mm -hmm. Dawn doesn't realize Amy is her daughter. Dawn thinks she had a baby named Sky, who was taken away at birth. Can you tell me about Sky? Sky is my baby. And social services uh, just took her away and put her up for adoption. And I can't have her back. And so who is sitting next to you? Oh, she's a friend, sir. I mean, I think her name is good, and, and I'm very fond of her. But it's not, not the same as having your own. Amy, how does that make you feel, listening to Dawn? Great. All right, so now that we watched that video, what did you think about the experiences there? What you notice are, what you notice with that video probably was that every different state, every different personality, every different alter had a different history, had a different way of behaving, had a different identity, a way of viewing themselves and conceptualizations. Even though it's like a different, like, you know, values and things like that, different kinds of things that are important to them. These are all things that, you know, these different alter states might have. These are like uh, well-constructed uh, personalities. So dissociative identity sort was formerly known as multiple personality disorder. So however, this, this disorder has been changed to dissociative identity disorders have multiple personality disorder because these are not complete personalities. They are fragments of personalities. So this disorder is going to be characterized by switching to different identities. These identities are also known as alters. So you might feel the presence of two or more people talking or living inside of your head. You might just feel as though you're possessed by other identities. Each identity might have a unique name, a unique personal history and characteristics. This could be obvious uh, differences in voice, uh, gender identities, or sexual preferences, mannerisms, and even such physical quality as like maybe like having the need for eyeglasses or having a limp. So there are also differences in how familiar each identity is with the others. So people with a dissociative identity disorder might have some alters that are aware of one another, or they might have some alters where they don't know there are, there are other alters uh, present. And people with dissociative identity disorder also uh, typically have dissociative amnesia and often have dissociative fugue. So when it comes to uh, dissociative identity disorder, there are some cultural considerations to think about. So in some cultures, people view this as possession, um, demonic possession, being possessed by spirits, being possessed by ancestors. And you need to rule out that these experiences the individual having are like not a part of their culture or part of their other religious practice. All right, so let's go ahead and move forward here. All right, so here's some stats here for you about dissociative identity disorder. So the average number of fragmented identities or alters is going to be 10. That's the average number. So that means you could have a few or you could have hundreds. Uh, the common fragmented identities within a person with DID are going to be the child identity. So this is usually the persona that experienced the trauma and the trauma is contained within the child identity. There is a protector. So this is the, this is the identity that arose out of the trauma in order to protect the child identity from the re-experiences of that trauma or that trauma happening again. There's the persecutor. So this is a little bit different 
different from the protector. So the protector is going to be on defense and the persecutor is going to be on offense. So this is somebody who's going to attack those who pose a threat to the child. And then there's the opposite sex role. So this is where, you know, um, a mother figure or a father figure is created. And this is in a way to nurture the child or maybe to replace the lack of parenting that they're missing or to fill the void left by whatever kind of abuse or trauma had occurred. Like you said in the previous slide, there are going to be some amnesia um, between these different identities. So some of these identities might not be aware of the other ones. So you could have like a secret a secret altar that comes up um, compared to the other ones that uh, fills some kind of specific role that the other ones aren't aware of. This is not like the movie Split. You're not going to be turning into a beast. You're not going to be jumping on ceilings, snapping dudes next. So yeah, don't ask me about that. And don't write about that either. Uh -uh. Okay, so we'll talk about some etiology here. So dissociative disorders usually develop as a way to cope with trauma. Dissociative disorders most often form in children subjected to long-term physical, sexual, or emotional abuse, or less often a home environment that's frightening or highly unpredictable. So the stress of war or natural disasters also bring on dissociative disorders. Now, it's very important to understand one thing about personalities, that person personal identity is still forming during childhood. So a child is more able than an adult to like step outside of themselves and observe trauma as though it's happening to a different person. So during this situation or during this period of your life, we are more susceptible to dissociation. A child is actually, uh, it's easier for a child to dissociate, that the child could learn that dissociation helps them to cope or endure with a traumatic experience. So this coping mechanism might be in response to like other kinds of stressful situations throughout life, which might lead to additional dissociative episodes. So right over here, we want to look at some of these, some of these, uh, some of these factors that kind of interact with one another. We have overwhelming stress. So there's overwhelming stress. This is what we're talking about. We're talking about the trauma. This is what we're talking about. We're talking about the abuse. This is something that a child or an individual cannot process. This is something that is too much for them to bear. It exceeds their cognitive capacity, their emotional capacities. And then you have, you know, this association occurring. You have a dissociative capacity. Different individuals have a greater susceptibility to dissociation. So just like hypnosis, right? Some people are more prone to hypnosis. So individuals with a greater dissociative capacity might be individuals who have a higher imagination, overactive imagination, are more prone to thoughts of fantasy, things like that. That could be your dissociative capacity. So that'd be something like, yes, you can associate. No, you won't dissociate. It's like you have this magnitude. It's like you have like a very small dissociative capacity to like a larger dissociative capacity. And then also you have like lack of sufficient nurturing compassion. So this is like a, that unstable childhood, that unpredictable environment, um, a lot of trauma, a lot of abuse, a lot of emotional neglect. So these things can all interact with one another to increase the risk of dissociation. So on the next slide here, we have a video we're going to watch. And then when I get back, we'll talk about a little bit. Like I said, no one won't because I won't because you won't be here. But we'll I'll post all these on Compass. You can watch them at your own leisure. So here we go. Little video here about dissociation. Here's what I want you to do. Look at the altars present in this video. And then let me know what roles do you think these altars serve in the individual? Like what are the different roles? So keep, a, keep an eye out for that. I don't want you doing the strawberries. I can wash them though, right? And Papa, he has to have his coffee. They're the my mom does. And Chrissy wants to have her juice. I want to know where the pink donuts are. Breakfast time is a busy time at the Patillo home. The only place busier off. than the kitchen is Christine Patillo's mind. I'm just extra special. <laughs> Tristan, you are extra special. I love you. I love you. But they love me. What do we have going? Cindy was just out. Christine has six other personalities called alters. Am my Aunt Danny? Living inside her head. You don't like blueberries in your pancakes either, do you? I don't actually mind them. She despises fruit. All distinct and different, all with their own voice. I can hear them if I'm paying attention. They can look out through my eyes and they can see what's ever in my peripheral. That I want more. Sure. Out. That is two-year-old Cindy. The rest of the gang, as they're called, will introduce so, themselves. Wait, uh, I'm Christine. I'm Chrissy. I'm Tristan, the lone male. I'm she. I am Q. I do all the beads. Uh, I'm Rim. Christine has dissociative identity disorder, formerly known as multiple personality disorder. It's recognized by the American Psychiatric Association and affects just a fraction of 1% of the population. I am going to always get the play. <laughs> Who's my wife going to partner up with? I'll be the shuffler. 
Doctors say Christine's brain got shuffled, fractured is the clinical term, when she was a little girl. But I just seem to be going the wrong direction all the time. And that's different from when? <laughs> Funny. Or, oh, that's what I'm going to do. Here, here, shabang. That didn't work out well for me at all. Christine suffered physical and emotional abuse from her father throughout her childhood and what can be politely described as torturous sexual abuse at the hands of a neighbor from the ages of seven to nine. Her childhood, a cruel game of survival. That was complete being imprisoned in my mind. Drawings Christine did in therapy show the violent battles inside her head. Doctors say when the brain can't handle any more abuse, it fractures into different personalities, and each one often serves a purpose. Instead of Christine suffering the sexual abuse, Rim, a tough tomboy, would appear and absorb the shame. The alter she, a gruff 30-year-old lesbian, would come out and take on the abuse from Christine's father. But as Christine got older, the personalities that once protected her turned. But there's a little bit of a triangle scar from a tip of an iron. Rim led Christine to the dangerous world of drugs and promiscuity. Christine waking in places with people she didn't remember. Alter, she was the worst abuser. And we have a scar on our, our in our hairline from when she smashed a picture frame. She, I, if she used to smash, smash pots and pans on us and we'd have really big gnarly bruises and burns. Burning was a big thing. It went on for years. It's so frightening to feel like you don't have access to your mind or can keep control or that people think that you're a freak or that something's going on. It's been a trying 26 years of marriage, to say the least, for Christopher. The couple never had children because between Christopher, Christine, and her six other personalities, eight was enough. He's been husband, father, friend, and enemy, often all within the same 60 second span. The diagnosis 10 years ago answered a lot of questions for him. One question, however, never needed answering. Why did you stay? Um, this is my life and this is my wife and it's a beautiful thing and and i love being on the journey with her whoop, 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 whoop. come on come on dixie girl let's go for a walk dixie come on after two decades of therapy christine has come to control the people living in her head but all is well it is the abuse from her other personalities is stopped and Christine lives a relatively routine life. In fact, the altars are actually helping her to better integrate into society. These are my bead people. Everything I make is one of a kind. This is Q, who has started her own small business selling beaded jewelry. Christine watches Q do this from inside her own head and feels inspired to do more in public herself. For Q, it's more about changing others, the not the six altars. Different is uncomfortable for a lot of people, and, and we're just trying to make our different not be so spooky or so uh, confusing to people. One major step in that direction, the book Christine has written about her experience. One face with seven voices, hoping to bring understanding and acceptance to a disorder so hard to comprehend. We're at a place where we can be in society as a person with multiple personalities and that we have uh, an ability to talk to people and help them become more aware about a condition that is confusing and terrifying to people sometimes. Is that my poppy? Ultimately, many with this illness hope to meld all the personalities back into one so they can lead a so-called normal life. A cloud of butterflies above a purple lilac bush. But for the Patillos, this is normal. And this is the way they'll stay. It is my family. And it is um, uh, a family that I would never want to lose. Yes, I, I have a wonderful husband. I have great friends. And we've got to meet some amazing people on this journey. And we're just beginning. And she's just a normal person. And we have, she just has all these people that live inside her. All right, so what do you think about that video? You saw there are a lot of different altars. You, you heard a little bit about what happened in her childhood and what might have led to these altars. Also, you've seen how they could be at different ages. They can have all sorts of different kinds of components of identity. And so what do you think about that? Was it very interesting? Come to office hours, send me an email. We talk about it. I would say, you know, I would, like, I would recommend coming to the in-person discussion sessions, but I'm not going to recommend that because, you know, I'm not trying to like, mm -mm, yeah, don't, don't come to the in-person discussion sessions unless you want to. I'm not going to encourage or do 
discourage you coming there for reasons. Okay, so let's talk about the etiology of DID. Do you remember what etiology means? Do you remember? Yeah, all right. I should be like Dora the Explorer. Can you say etiology? That's right. <laughs> the study of causes. I need some sleep. So biological factors, uh, little is actually known about the etiology of DID. So when we're talking about this, th this these are people uh, just hypothesizing, still doing studies, still checking things out. Like we saw in that news report, less than a fraction of a percent of a percent of the total population suffers from DID. So it can be very hard to know what's going on. As you can probably imagine, it's probably very hard to do like a twin study or an adoption study about DID. Now, is there like a single genetic factor that can contributes to DID? Like, can I give you a genetic test? Like, give you like a 23 and me, and then figure out what your risk for DID is? The answer is no. So there's very little known about the biological ideology. There's very little known about genetic influences. And one of the key components of diagnosing DID is to actually rule out these factors and make sure there's no brain injuries. There's no other kinds of seizures or lesions or other kinds of ish neurological issues that might be leading to these kind of behaviors. Some people have been able to rule out DID um, in certain individuals based on, you know, brain trauma. So right here with DID, we're looking at this just from a psychological perspective. Now, when it comes to social factors, people feel that there is something about parenting that I, might contribute to DID. So for example, DID occurs in both um, parentings or parents who are both abusive and loving. It's not like, oh, if you have abusive parents, you're going to have DID. Or if you have loving parents, you're not going to have DID. There is something about parenting that contributes to this, but you couldn't say that parenting alone causes this. Now, if we're talking about sexual abuse, that sexual sexual abuse would lead to the DID. But you know what I'm saying, okay. So when it comes to attachment styles, so attachment styles are the way that a child bonds with their parents. So you have the disorganized attachment style. So a disorganized attachment style is going to be a detachment style where there's a chaotic level of love and support within the relationship where punishments aren't equivalent across different transgressions. All right, so we have some technical difficulties there. So we're talking about attachment style. When it comes to attachment style, this disorganized attachment style, um, this is just where there's a, you know, there's not really a stable environment. Uh, the love isn't stable. The discipline isn't stable. It varies. And it's just like the child has a hard time of adapting to what is required of them in order to uh, please their parents. So this can be, so this kind of an unstable backgrounds, unstable childhood. Researchers have theorized that this has some link to the development of DID. All right, be the post-traumatic model. And so this is based off of the trauma and state-dependent learning. So what this means is that learning is best recalled in the same state. So this is where where somebody cannot recall um, something that might have happened to them traumatically in the past outside of a certain state. So this state might be like a personality state, right? What could happen is if, or an, if an individual is traumatized, they can create a personality state that can contain that trauma and the memories of the trauma. So what you can do is if you, let's say this example right here is of Mary, right? So Mary uh, cannot recall incest at age four, um, but her alter Sandy is able to. So Sandy could also be the pet name given to Mary by her father during the periods of sexual abuse. So the, the, the abuse itself, the trauma itself, um, could have some role in forming those alternate identities to where something about that trauma, something that occurred might be, might create that identity. Here's a good, here's a good uh, example of this. There was an episode in The Haunting of Hill House where, you know, I think it's Theo, the one with the magic hands, um, is investigating the child who she thinks is being sexually molested or troubled by like the smiling man. And then she goes to the basement of the house and she sees that there's this wood pattern on the ceiling that looks like a smiling man. So that smiling man is like the personification of the trauma. So the trauma isn't, it's not like the, uh, well, I won't spoil it for you, but you can put, put two and two together. But the trauma of sexual abuse was contained within the smiling man. So this is a little bit different. This isn't like the child adopting a different personality. This is the child containing the trauma within the smiling man persona that she created. So it's an external persona that is traumatizing her rather than her adoptive father. In this, in the same similar function, individual could be tra traumatized and then within themselves create this compartment to contain the trauma. So Mary doesn't recognize, doesn't remember the incest, but Sandy, the altered state, holds that incest so that Mary can continue to live her life without that incest happening to her. And then if incest or sexual abuse or something similar occurs again, then Sandy 
might come to the front to capture that trauma and retain it within Sandy so that Mary, the prime altar, doesn't have to bear that trauma. Okay, if that didn't make sense, email office hours. All right. All right, so now we have the socio-cognitive model. And so for the socio-cognitive model, we actually have some readings on this. So why don't you go ahead and do those readings. From this perspective, so let's just break down the word. Socio, what does socio mean? Social, society, right? Multiple people, culture. Then cognitive, cognition, thinking, thoughts, right? So the thoughts of society, group thinking, those th the culture, how culture, you know, interacts with our thoughts. All right, so this could be a consequence of social learning and social expectancies. So what this means is when I go into a therapeutic session, we have the inadvertent, inadvertent therapies cueing where I'm expressing these difficulties. And then the therapist who, you know, was trained on crystaltherapy.com looks at me and says, who else is in there with you? Who else, who else is there with you? Is Sandy there? Can I speak to Sandy? Will Sandy come forward? You know, that kind of thing. And then due to expectancies and demand characteristics, the individual, if they're more susceptible, more prone to influence, like the people who are like, more prone to hypnosis, they might feel this need to acquiesce or to assent to whatever the therapist is, is uh, saying. So now you have, oh, Sandy's here. I'm Sandy, but there's actually no Sandy. It's just that the therapist cued this. This is an example of iatrogenesis, where the treatment causes the disorder. Iatrogenesis, when the treatment causes the disorder. Now also we have media influences, right? So we have somebody who's watching TV, you're watching Oprah, and Oprah's giving everybody free cars, but now Oprah's giving everybody DI ID because now people watch these videos and they say I have that sensation that's something that exists that's something for me and now they do it and once again everybody this is from the socio cognitive perspective so this is a way of conceptualizing the ideology of DID so do not take this as dismissing DID in general this is dismissing DID or trying to trying to to debunk DID or or explain the ideology of DID through this model to try to tamper down you know the DID okay good so I don't want to get canceled on Twitter I ain't got time for that drama now there's also socio-cultural expectations regarding manifestations of DID so if I'm in a certain culture or religious group that prides itself or really champions this idea of entering altered states or taking on multiple personalities or receiving different spirits this could also you know lead to more DID but also not even just religious just cultural you know like you know we do this little thing over here and then the ancestors come and talk to us. Some people could be more vulnerable to DID based on that because that's you're learning that multiple personalities, you know, are okay. Now we can talk about that all day. That's going to be outside the purview of this course. So these influences and other risk factors associated combine to make vulnerable individuals believe that alters are responsible for their experiences and symptoms. So what are, what are you talking about some of the other risk factors? Well, like I talked about before, the trauma, the abuse, right? The, uh, the unstable childhood environment, the different attachments attachment styles. These are all things that can combine to cause these issues. And now when you have this inverted therapist cueing, you have these different media influences, you have these different socio-cultural expectations regarding the manifestations of dissociative identity disorder. Now you are at, put at a greater risk. This is where things are combining as an interaction. All right. So here are some additional risk factors for DID, specifically through the socio-cognitive model. We have fantasy proneness. So this is your tendency to have deep, vivid involvement in fantasy, a live action role, play, uh, daydreaming for hours at a time, coming up with creative stories and things like that. Now, does that mean that if you're a LARPer or if you're into creative stories or Twilight fan fiction, that you're like going to have DID? No, it's just a risk factor that might place you at risk for DID. Okay. Now, suggestibility. So suggestibility is going to be your tendency to incorporate misleading information into memory. This could be the same thing when it comes to like hypno hypnosis, right? And remember, you can insert false memories in the people. So there was this, uh, there was this case, I don't know the specific case, but there were these therapists that were finding, they were trying this new hypnosis therapy and they were finding all these cases of childhood sexual abuse and it was pretty severe. And then it turned out that childhood sexual abuse hadn't occurred in all these cases that through the therapist cueing their clients during these hypnotic sessions were actually inserting memories or misleading memories of trauma of childhood sexual abuse into 
to their clients by leading them, by leading them to these things like, oh, you remember you were in the bed and your father was there and your father was touching you. That was the kind of stuff they were doing. So it was a very, um, very big thing. This is back in my day. Of course, I'm older than you are, but you can look it up. It's all good. Uh, we can talk more about that during office hours. So your suggestibility does place you at risk for associative identity disorder. So when it comes to your sleep wake cycle, this is going to be associated with dissociation. So what happens when you don't sleep? What happens when you have insomnia? What happens when, you know, you sleep too much or whatever? So let's look at this right here. So sleep loss is associated with dissociative like experiences. Have you ever been up for multiple days at a time, you know, drinking caffeine or whatever it is you kids do nowadays to stay up? I don't know what you're doing. So it's just like you have these dreamlike experiences where this doesn't feel real. I've been up for so long. You know, you look into the sky and the sky is multiple colors and you're like, oh, geez, I got to get some sleep and you're hearing things, you're misremembering things. So this can cause dissociative like experiences by not having any sleep. Your brain needs to rest. You could also have executive functioning problems if you have a, a lack of sleep. So you're thinking about like, how's your mood when you're super sleepy, right? Are you, are you the same? Are you more irritable? What's going on? How about your behaviors? Are you the same person? You know, like, I mean, you're not the same person when you're hungry, eat a Snickers. You're definitely not the same person when you're sleepy, sleepnumber.com. So sleep hygiene um, definitely can help with restoring your cognitive functioning and alleviating some of those dissociative experiences. So there's actually sleep hygiene intervention where people will try to reset your sleep cycle or teach you how to sleep appropriately, going to bed at a good time, waking up at a good time, different kinds of medications and supplements to try to help you stay asleep. So go to sleep and stay asleep, uh, Z Quill, you know, all that kind of good stuff. Now remember, this is in the, the reading that we had. So pop in that reading and do it. And I can tell, <laughs> Some of you ain't been doing the readings. You know what I'm saying? All right. So now let's talk about confirmation bias. Now, most of you have probably heard confirmation bias when it comes to things like racial justice and things like that. But confirmation bias also applies to therapists as well um, and also clinic clients. So people tend to seek information that is consistent with their role, with their view of the world. If I think that DID is a function of trauma, then I will try to find DID cases among people who have experienced trauma, right? I have a habit and everything looks like a nail. That's that situation there. So people who discount information inconsistent with the worldview is also a part of confirmation bias. I might actually discount or ignore uh, cases of DID that occur in individuals who haven't experienced trauma because I'll believe only people who've experienced trauma can have DID. And then on the flip side, I'm thinking, well, everybody who has trauma has DID and only people who have trauma have DID. And I'm just like out there, you know, diagnosing everybody. Oh, you, you were molested. You have DID. Oh, you were in the car crash. You have DID. Oh, this happened to you. You have DID. See how that works? This is uh, more of the way that confirmation bias comes out. And we kind of talked about this with the, the leading questions of the therapist. So this is going to be the atrogenesis we've been talking about lately. Remember, iatrogenesis, this is when the treatment causes the disorder. I'd like to say the therapist could be leading the client. Have you ever experienced sexual abuse? Was it your father? Was it your uncle? Was it a teacher? You, you've you been feeling bad. Did something happen to you in college? Were you drugged? Were you raped? And then the therapist feels like there's some kind of trauma. Let me, let me back up for a second here. So this confirmation bias happens more than you would think. I do motivational interviewing at Rosecrans. Well, actually not at Rosecrans, through Rosecrans, because now we do everything digitally. So I'm on, you know, Zoom or WebEx and we're doing the sessions and I'll talk to some of the other cl uh, clinicians there. They have these hypotheses about what's ailing the uh, the client and what's wrong with them. And so then they tr what they try to do is they try to tell us, our, the student clinicians in training, what they think is wrong with the client. And what happens is some student clinicians, myself included, when I first started out, hear that. And now we're trying to prove that, oh, you, it's like they tell us they had trauma. So now we're trying to bring up that trauma or talk about that trauma. I talk about the, uh, the abusive boyfriend and now you're trying to bring up the abusive boyfriend and other kinds of things. And motivational interviewing, the funny thing about motivational interviewing is none of that matters. So motivational interviewing, I don't need to know if you have trauma or help you through depression or your anxiety or anything. With motivational interviewing, I'm trying to help you generate ideas for how to achieve your change goals. And in the context of Rosecrans, that change goal is sobriety. So it is a, it's something that is client-led, not clinician-led. So I'm not supposed to have these hidden agendas, these ulterior motives when I'm talking to clients. I'm asking them questions, providing 
writing reflections and trying to help them out. And what I'll notice is that there is a bias there if someone tells me what's going on with the client. And especially with newer clinicians, they're like, well, how am I supposed to get to the trauma? How am I supposed to? Well, you're not supposed to. That's not the purpose of the treatment. So this happens where you go outside of the goals of your specific treatment based on prior information or concept or misconceptions about the client. So this can lead to leading questions and motivational interviewing, but it can also lead to leading questions when it comes to dissociative identity disorder. These kind of leading questions are going to be, is there someone in there, is there someone else in there I can talk to? Who else is in there with you? Who is the protector? Like, where is this trauma stored and located? These kind of things are cueing vulnerable individuals and might be placing them at a greater risk of developing or presenting with dissociative identity disorder symptoms. So once again, iatrogenesis, the creation of disorder in an attempt to treat it. This is what, this is a good example of that. And the whole thing about Rosecrans, that whole example I gave you there was to let you know that treatment bias exists, which is why it's funny when some people say that bias doesn't exist and bias is illegal or bias training is illegal. That's kind of funny to me because as a, as a therapist, um, I experience and I've I've witnessed bias occur, and I can only assume that depending on what kind of authority you have, you might also have bias as well, but that's neither here nor there. Next slide. So let's talk about epidemiology. There was actually a large increase in the number of cases since the 1980s, and this had to do with things like the movie Sybil, other kinds of books, the introduction of sensationalism on day daytime television, Donahue, Oprah Winfrey, having people on with multiple personality disorders. We have some information here about Sybil. We have a video about it too. We'll, I'll press play. And you can look at it there. Some people also argue that this surge, a number of cases, might also be attributed to the fact that DID was underdiagnosed in the past. And this is actually common with a lot of things. So there was a study that showed an association between vaccines and autism as like reasons why autism is caused by vaccines. If vaccines are bad, you shouldn't vaccinate your kids. Well, that author was later discredited because the things that he was saying were false because he actually manufactured his data and then he altered his analyses to support his claims. This was a, a single study that was done. And of course, as always happens with retractions, the publish of the false article is big news and the retraction is no news. And so to this day, you will still see people citing this study show, that showed that there was an association between vaccines and autism. To this day, people still cite that study and that study was false. So that's that's why when I say, when it comes to studies, not everything that you see is true. So if you ever see some somebody talking about how vaccines cause autism, that was based on a false study. That researcher was discredited. But still, to this day, anti-vaxxers still cite that study. It's madness. When it comes to autism, autism functions with underdiagnosis as well, right? Because people are saying, why is there so much autism nowadays? Well, maybe autism hasn't increased. Maybe autism has always been here but we're just getting better at detecting it. We're just getting better at recognizing the symptoms. We're understanding greater what symptoms on the fringes. Think about like cancer detection. If we're able to detect cancer sooner, the number of cancer cases will increase. That doesn't mean that the rates of cancer in the population are increasing. That means that now we're able to identify cancer sooner, quicker, and with greater accuracy. So that is a good thing. So that probably means that cancer has been high for a long time and we just couldn't detect it. But now we can detect it. Of course, that's a simple explanation. It's more complex than that. But I want you to think about that. People say, oh, this is increasing. It was not increasing. We're just now starting to recognize it. We're now able to detect it earlier. So it doesn't mean that the rates are going up. It just means that we are able to identify it sooner. And maybe that's what's going on with DID. I can go on for that for days and days, but you didn't pay for that kind of class, you know, so we're going to keep it in psychology, but you can come to office hours or send me an email and we can talk about it all day. We also want to look at how the rates of it of DID going up might be due to iatrogenesis, because now that people are aware of DID, maybe there's an implicit bias involved with that. And now I'm overdiagnosing DID, or I'm trying to insert DID these symptoms into individuals. And also this is due to the fact that DID is more well known it's in the media. 
And due to shifts in sociocultural norms, now people are becoming more suggestible to DID and DID-like symptoms. So now we have a video here we're gonna watch. Oh, wait, that's the wrong button. Boom, there we go. So we're gonna go ahead and watch this video. Um, I'm gonna jump out the way. My YouTube channel is now fully demonetized. I did it for you kids. I did it, I did it for the kids. I did it for the kids. So we're gonna go ahead and watch this video and then we'll get back and talk about it for a second. Sybil was an incredibly powerful phenomenon in the 70s, the 1970s. Um, when the book debuted, people just went crazy over it, and within just a couple of years, it had sold over six million copies. It was selling about as briskly as the Bible when it first came out. And before Sybil came out, multiple personality disorder was a very, very rare disease. In the entire history of the world, there were, had only been a few dozen cases. Within just a few years, thousands of people had gone to psychiatrists and been diagnosed with multiple personality disorder. Almost all of them were women. What I found out in my research was that Sybil's um, psychiatrist had known about multiple personality disorder ever since she was a medical student, and she wanted her own case for many years. I also found out that the woman who was Sybil ever since she'd been a child had been um, physically ill, She'd been mentally ill with other problems like anxiety and depression. She was also a very suggestible and fantasy prone little girl. She had imaginary playmates and she lived in a world of fantasy. And she was very susceptible to people's suggestions about what she should think or do. And I found out in my research that um, she had gone to a psychiatrist who really wanted a case of multiple personality disorder and um, was willing to give Sybil a lot of the attention and affection that Sybil craved ever since she was a child, um, but at a cost, and that cost was that she produced multiple personality disorder. Dr. Wilbur was not a good writer. She knew she needed a professional writer to do this, and she found Flora Schreiber. Flora Schreiber was looking for the next big thing herself. She wanted to write a bestseller, and that's how they got together. Dr. Wilbur, Sybil, and Flora Schreiber were able to pull off this crazy production, which is what Sybil the book and Sybil the movie was, because people wanted to believe that women could have many, many personalities. It was a time in history when women were developing new roles in the workplace, they were developing new domestic roles, they were developing new sexual roles. It was right after the sexual revolution in the 19, late 1960s, early 70s. It was a time when women were going to work, they were leaving the home. And so the idea that um, you could split into many different personalities and that each of those personalities would help you, would help the other personalities or help your core self do what you couldn't do otherwise, was incredibly appealing during that time. The takeaway from Sybil Exposed is a lesson, and that's that particularly when it involves women, science always needs to be taken with a grain of salt when mental health professionals, doctors, any kind of scientists come along and say, we now understand something we never understood before. Um, it's really simple or it's almost miraculous. When you hear things like that that just make the solution to a problem sound really exciting and really simple or really sexy, you have to be skeptical. All right, so there we go. So uh, what do you think uh, that individual felt about uh, Sybil, right? You see what I'm saying? So some people feel like there was a agenda behind the creation of DID. Some people feel like DID is not a real thing. DID is very controversial. And this won't be the only disorder we'll, we will talk about, which is controversial. A lot of personality disorders are controversial, which we'll get into a little bit later. It's not uncommon to hear people with clinical backgrounds with PhDs 
and MDs that feel like dissociative identity disorder is not a real thing. And that's because of the damage that's been done through sensationalization. It's just like, for example, it's just like with essential oils. Essential oils are good. They have some kind of function. Soothing, things like that, it's all good. But the problem is when sensationalization occurs and people tell you that essential oils cure things or essential oils can replace other kinds of medications, then you have to ask yourself if this is you know, like, like, am I, am I, am I just believing in the hype too much? Am I just going down the train and now I just, you know, whatever, you know, it's all, you know, you just got to ask yourself, you know, are you falling to any kind of, uh, you know, are you falling, believing the hype? Are you getting caught in sensationalism? Okay. So let's talk about factitious disorder and malingering, um, in the context of the dissociative identity disorder. So individuals who feign dissociative identity disorder do not report the subtle symptoms of like intrusion characteristics or the intrusion characteristics of the disorder. Instead, they tend to overreport well publicized symptoms of a disorder, such as like dissociative amnesia, and they underreport the less publicized comorbid symptoms like depression. So, individuals who feign dissociative identity disorder tend to be relatively undisturbed by or might even seem to enjoy having the disorder. In contrast, individuals with genuine dissociative identity disorder tend to be ashamed of and overwhelmed by their symptoms and they end up underreporting their symptoms or deny their condition. So sequential observation, uh, corroborating history, and intensive psychometric and psychological assessment is helpful in identifying those who might be malingering or exhibiting uh, factitious disorder. So malingering is when you're faking something and then factitious disorder is a disorder where you are manufacturing symptoms in order to meet criteria. So individuals who malinger dissociative identity disorder usually create limited stereotyped alternate identities with feigned amnesia and this is related to events uh, where this way to like um, events for which like gain is sought. So there's some way for the person to benefit from having this disorder. So for example, someone might present an all good identity and an all bad identity in the hope of gaining exculpation for a crime. We'll talk about this a little bit later, but there was a case of Kenneth Bianchi. So this is a, a serial killer, kidnapper, and rapist who was also known as the Hillside Strangler. This guy was very pro prolific, did a lot of killings. And then he, when he went to court, he tried to say that he had dissociative ident identity disorder, that er the person who killed them was not him, that he's a good guy, but his alter was a bad guy. Uh, this didn't work out. And he's currently serving a life sentence in the Washington State Penitentiary. Okay, so now we're going to have a video uh, just talking about uh, DID. And then we'll get back together and then we'll talk about whatever, whatever, whatever. You already know the deal. Why am I keep saying this? You know, I'm going to play the video. I'll make some comments. I'll post it on Compass. You already know what's happening. I'm not going to waste your time. So when you're treating somebody with this condition, who are you treating? You spend a lot of time early on doing what we call mapping the system. You're getting to know which are the key alters. Because they're called alters. Yes, technically we call them alters. And it's very important to get to know who does what. And because they all have a role. And so as a therapist, your job is to work out, you know, what their role is, because then you can understand, you know, why they're there and, and, and what they're going to be concerned about. And then one of the important questions I ask each of them is what is your trauma awareness? And some of them have no awareness of trauma at all. They have no idea that, that anybody was traumatized. And that allows them to go out and function. And then you have the ones who are holding the trauma. You know, a, a, a metaphor that I, I use with these patients a bit is that they've got a nursery full of these very young you know, child parts that is staffed by warriors who are all outwards facing. They're very protected. And, and, and their skills, as, particularly as they become adults, you do not screw with these people, right? They have the capacity to um, defend themselves very strongly. So you've got these, these young child parts that are living in this space where nobody has told them it was over. And because the system is built for protection and safety, they often don't have parts that are very good at caring for those young parts. So what you're doing as a therapist is you're letting those, those young parts know that not only is the war over, but there are people now who actually do care about their welfare. And the best way to do that is you mobilise parts of the 
the, the person, more mature, alters to actually become parent figures to those, to those young exiles. How does it come about, though? I guess we're talking about an extreme version of our brains. When does it kick in? Yeah. Well, this goes to the heart of the condition because we can all dissociate if we're subjected to sufficient distress. But for most of us, that capacity requires an enormous uh, traumatic experience to make you do this once our brain is more mature. But the younger we are, the easier it is to dissociate off parts of your mind. So for so children who are subjected to significant traumas prior to the age of eight, and, and the younger you go, probably the easier it is, they are able to split off parts of their mind in this way. So you're saving yourself. You're, absolutely. Their mind is just coming up with an incredibly sophisticated, clever solution to a scenario that most of us would not, could not begin to understand or relate to. All right, everybody. So that's a video about the treatment of dissociative identity disorder. We'll talk about this real quick here. Antidepressants and anti-anxiety medications reduce distress associated with DID, but not the symptoms themselves. The main goal of any kind of DID treatment is integration. So what you want to do is you want to have in individuals identify all the different identities to come together, fuse together into one. So it's kind of like a post-traumatic uh, stress disorder where you want to try to reintegrate the trauma into somebody's life narrative. That way they can move forward from what has happened to them, not to diminish what has happened to them, but to help them to just accept that all and have it all fuse into who they are as a person so they can integrate, integrate that, right? That's what you want to do here. You want to try to integrate all the different identities together and fuse into one. So the treatment is done through multiple phases. So number one, you want to stabilize the individual. This is where the uh, medication comes in. You want to make sure that you provide therapy for the traumatic memories. So some of the therapeutic programs that we talked about with post-traumatic uh, stress disorder can work here. And then the final step is personality integration. So this is all new. The treatment of dissociative identity disorder is not something that's been around for a long time. People have been working on it, tweaking it, trying to see what works. And because it's so rare, it's kind of hard to do. Important to understand that none of these treatments are evidence-based. And what does that mean? That means these haven't been conducted in rigorous scientific studies. This is going to be something where if someone gives you a treatment for ZID, you're kind of just throwing yourself to the wind, hoping it all works out. So there's not really like gold standard standard empirically supported treatments that people that people have for DID. It's going to be something that maybe works for some but not for others. So it's very important to understand there are no evidence-based treatments for DID. And maybe there is. And maybe it just came out last week. And maybe you're going to send me some email saying, Walter, look what I found on the Google. But well, whatever, dude. On the quiz, they ain't going to be there. So it's no evidence-based treatments for DID on the quiz. How about that? There we go. All right. So everybody, that's it for a lecture. You have questions, please come to office hours. I mean, send me an email. Um, if you feel like it, go to the in-person discussion sessions. I'm not going to encourage you to attend those because of reasons. You know, I want you to think about your safety first, but we have options here for you. If you're, I mean, I really want to encourage you to be like, you know, engaged with the course, to reach out. I mean, honestly, this is going to be on you. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, I could sit there and email every one of you individually and see why you're not, you know, doing whatever it is you're doing. I mean, I could do that, but am I gonna? Probably not. So what I suggest is that you send me an email, in the office hours, just hop in for a second. If, but you know what? I mean, hey, at the end of the day, if you're checked out, you're checked out. I get it. Like this is all tough and rough. But I'm gonna put the gr I'm gonna put out the grades. Do you know what I mean? I'm gonna put out the grades in the, the semester. So. I mean, I want you to really think about that. But if you got to drop, you got to drop. I mean, it is what it is. It's just one of them things. All right. So, so send me an email. If you're struggling in the class, come to office hours, watch the videos, take notes, look at the study videos that I post, take the quizzes. There we go. That's what we're going to do. Okay. And don't email me about dropping the class. Just drop the class. Seriously. Oh my gosh. What should I do? I don't know. I can't. I, it's your life. You got to live it. That's, that's college. It's, this is your life now. So you need to live your own life. I can't tell you what to do. Your parents can't tell you what to do. Your advisors can't tell you what to do. No one can tell you what to do. Like most of you are over 18. You got to figure out for yourself. So if you feel like dropping a class, drop the class. 
But if you want to stick it out, if you want to try to take it more seriously, if you want to try actually reading the readings, if you want to try, you know, actually going to the DSM-5 that I provide for you to get a better understanding of it, whatever. But if you're just taking this class, take the class, a C is a degree. So it's just like, you know, if you want to get a B or an A, especially if you want to get an A, you're going to put more work in. Remember, former for academic success for every one hour you're enrolled in, two to three hours per week in work, and that's for every class. And that's, that's what I did when I was an undergrad. And so look where it got me. It got me here. And I did it in my 30s. So you have way more energy than I do. So there you go. That's me. You know, so you're busy. Shoot, I'm busy. You know what I'm talking about? I'm in a PhD program. I see clients and I teach. You see what I'm saying? So like I've been doing multiple things. So, I mean, yeah, you got to figure it out for yourself. I'm here to help you figure it out. You know what I'm talking about? But I'm not going to do it for you. So I had to get it off my chest. So I want you to know that that I I want to help you, but there's like 90 something of you. I can't be your tutor. You know what I mean? I can't reach out to all of you. It's too much time. You know, so I'm I'm asking you to reach out to me. I'm asking you to contact me if you need help. You know, don't don't do that thing where you don't contact. I know people who just don't email people, they don't talk to people, and then they're they're mad at those people because they didn't get the help they need. Listen, I'm a psychologist not a psychic, okay? I subscribe to ESPN, but I don't have ESP. So I'm here to help you, but you're gonna have to do me a favor. Go have to meet me halfway. Type in WJV3 at illinois.edu, type in something, and then press send, and then we can have a conversation. But I can't do this thing where, because some of you send me emails, and it sounds like you were expecting me to do something for you that I never said I do for you. So like, I need you to send me an email and just like, let's have a conversation like adults. You know what I'm talking about? Okay. So that's the end of this rant. I'm glad you all had a good time. Um, we're going to have a quiz this week. Make sure you watch this video before you take the quiz. There are going to be DID questions on the quiz. Oh, guess what? You could have been doing the DID reading since day one because the DSM-5 was always up there. So whatever. All right. So Talk to you later. Peace, peace, peace.